injustice that we're asking him to make good on. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That word speedily means swiftly, that when God grants you justice, when he grants you your petitions, it comes with complete force. It comes like a tidal wave that takes care of everything. It comes with force. And I think this has Christ's coming in view, because I would say this, Everything that you pray about, everything that you are seeking from God in this life has in view Christ's coming. Let me tell you how that works. Every loved one you pray for, for their spiritual condition, for their health, for them to become a Christian, every difficult situation in your life, whether it be housing or your job or your finance or your health, Every bitterness and sin that just resides in your heart, that you just can't get rid of, you're saying, Lord, take it away, take it away. And all of your prayers, the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment comes when your Savior comes back. So you, you get a little bit of the answer in this life, but you get the ultimate answer when He comes. Because those things that we pray about, broken relationships, your broken health, your broken finances, the sin in our hearts, that is all gone when Christ comes back. That's done. That's over with. Your hurting relatives, your um, brother Carl's eyes, he'll look upon Jesus with healed sight. Your brother Joseph will stand before Jesus with the ability to stand, the ability to walk. When the king comes, the suffering of this life is over. So everything you pray for, it is granted to you ultimately when he comes back. And so this is what Christ is saying. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Or, or until that point, you know, before that point, have we just grown aware? So I'm, I'm not going to, you know, we just lose heart. We become weary. We become worn out. So he asks, when he, when he comes, will he find expression of faith on the earth, or will he not? So I want to ask you today, where are you today in this? Have you, have you lost heart? Have you lost heart to seek after God, to pray, to bring your petitions before Him? Or maybe, maybe you're different. Maybe you haven't lost heart. You just never begun to have heart in the first place. You're never motivated. You never stirred in your heart to begin with. You just don't bring your petitions before God. Where are you? Have you lost heart? Maybe you've never really begun in the, in the first place. To, to both the, those people, to both those types of people, if you've lost heart and just don't think about you know, the, re the requests that you need to bring before God, if you don't think about that anymore, you just never did in the first place, let me preach the gospel to you this morning, because if, if, I think if we can preach Christ to uh, ourselves and to our own hearts, then, then I think we'll find the motivation to pray. So where are you? Have you lost heart? Have you grown weary presenting your uh, requests to him? Maybe you've never really successfully begun. So, this, this judge, what we find in, in the judge, that the reason the judge example works for us is not because God is anything like the judge, but because God is totally the opposite from, from the judge. Uh, it, uh, God reminds us in Romans, that if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? What he's saying is that if God has done the hard work of providing a Savior to bring you back to him, to, to adopt you, to make you his child, then wouldn't he do the lesser things of granting your petitions and your needs. 
think about it like this. We talked about the, the president. None of us, none of us are important enough. Maybe you are, maybe I don't know. But just from what I know of us as a church, none of us, not even the most important person here is probably Pastor Rose of the community or whatever, is significant enough to pull out their phone and give President Obama a phone call. Hey, Mr. Obama, how you doing? Yeah. It would not happen. You would not appear before him. You would not get into the White House. You would not get it. It just wouldn't happen. But you know who can? Freely, Sasha Obama, Malia Obama, right? What is that? Those are his kids. And it, it works the same way with, with, with God. We have access to him. We have access to him not because of our own merits, because of our own goodness, but because of what Christ accomplished, because Christ brought us back to the Father. And if Christ has done that for us, then how should we not freely expect that he would grant us our needs and our petitions and justice, the things that we seek after, how should ultimately, in this life, yes, but ultimately, when, when he comes, it's all taken care of. Have you lost heart to seek him? Think about it from the perspective of the widow. What made the widow keep coming back? You would think that if there was an unjust judge, you, you know about it, say, man, this, this judge is not even going to give me what I want. This judge is unjust. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about man. Why does the widow keep going back to him? Why does the widow keep going back there? Why? You would think after the first ten times she gets the picture. What makes the widow persistent? Here's what I think it is. In the Old Testament, there were groups of people who were specifically, specially favored by God. Who God makes clear in his law, do not mess with these people. One of those was widows. The other was orphans. The other was foreigners and strangers. So God's always telling these people, look out for the widow and the, and the orphan. Don't do wrong by the widow and the orphan. A couple of verses from Deuteronomy. It says of God that he will execute the judgment for the fatherless and widows and he loves the stranger. Again, he says, you shall, he's speaking to the leaders of Israel, he said, you shall not pervert judgment for the stranger or the fatherless or for the widow. He tells farmers in Israel, he says, when you cut down your harvest in thy field and you forget a sheaf, in, in the field, if you forget uh, some wheat in the field, you shall not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the works of thy hands. So he gives a couple warnings. He says, do not pervert justice for the widow. Do not take advantage of the most vulnerable people in your society. He even says, if you have a field and you're harvesting it, and you forget and you forget to harvest some of it, don't go back and, and you know, get every scrap of it. Leave some for the widow, for the, fa for the fatherless. So, in this society, if there's anyone who had that right to come to the judge and say, you owe me justice, this is my right. If there's anyone who has that right in this society, it is the widow. The widow persisted because she had confidence in God's revealed law. Namely, God's special care for her. If anyone in this society had a divine sanction for their protection and peace and prosperity, it was the widow. God expresses that explicitly, and the widow knew that, and that motivated her persistence. Otherwise, where does the persistence come from? Why does Christ use that example? Why specifically a widow? Because the law says a judge, if you're a judge, you don't pervert justice for the orphan. 
for the widow, for the stranger that, that mm -hmm. has dwelt in, in your land. So if there's anyone who had a legal right to go and demand justice, it was the widow. And she does. The way this parallels us is if there's anyone who has a right, who has the access, who has the freedom and the liberty to bring our requests before God continually, persistently, it is His people. It is you. It is you who have faith in Christ. Who have been redeemed, who have been brought back to God because of your belief in the gospel, because of your simple faith in Christ, you belong to the Father. And that gives you access, that gives you confidence that you are His chosen one. And that should motivate you. If you have lost, if you have become wary, then I, I, I encourage you with that, that you, as God's chosen one, have access. You have the freedom to come to Him. And he says He will grant you justice speedily. Don't grow weary. Continue to pursue God in prayer with patience and with persistence. One day He comes and He grants you the ultimate fulfillment of everything that you have been looking for. Every health struggle in your life, every spiritual battle that you're not winning in, in this life, and every broken relationship, every injustice that you have suffered, every question that you have that you are unable to answer, when He comes, He grants it to you. But when He comes, will He find faith in the earth? Will He find that you have persisted or that you have grown weary in 2011. If he comes, you know, a long time from now, when he comes back, are, are you still persistent? He doesn't tell us when he comes back, because if we had a date, then our lives would be holy and worshipful for the last six months as we're getting ready, right? But he tells us, he doesn't tell us when it is, when it is but when he comes back, to, to grant you everything that you're looking for. Have you been enduring? Have you been persistent? Have you been seeking after him? You see, prayer has this great effect that, that it's not only changes the situations around you. We've heard this. That it, it changes you. As you seek after God, you're drawing closer to him, so you uh, are more obedient to him. You're more impassioned with him. You're more... Um, caught up and enraptured with him. And, and so that, that alone, that alone gives you the motivation. Sometimes you'll find that you pray for a friend who's struggling, you do it over and over and over, it has an impact on you. It makes you closer to God. It, it makes you more mindful of what he wants from you. So will we find faith in us when he comes, or, or have you grown weary? His coming is the point of fulfillment. It is the ultimate answer to every prayer that you have. Will you endure until his coming? You see, it's not just a pray, you know, have this need and uh, pray for it, and nope, God hasn't granted it. Sometimes the adversity is there in our lives that we continue to seek after Him. That, sometimes we, we need to think about this. I encourage you, thank God for the adversity in your life. Here's why. Would you be a Christian if it was not for the adversity in your life? Would you keep coming back? Would you keep renewing your faith in the Lord if it wasn't for the struggles and the adversity that keeps you dependent on Him? And in that, you have been given so much more than other people have. Will we endure until His coming? Let's pray. Lord, um, thank you for the, for the words of Scripture through Luke. Um, I pray for um, each of us here, myself, my brothers and sisters, that we would take to heart the words of Scripture that um, where we have lost that motivation to pray, or maybe if we have never begun, or maybe we have become weary and bitter, um, Lord, I pray that you would renew that in us through uh, what we find in Scripture.
you. You've renewed us um, that desire, that patience, that persistence. Um, I believe, Lord, that uh, those of us who are believers here this morning, that that is probably um, the sincere desire of our hearts. And so would you create that in us this morning as we dwell upon this scripture, as we leave, as we go to our homes. I pray that we would contemplate. I pray that we would um, think. And I pray that you would stir in, in our hearts and draw us back where we have lost our way. And, uh, we thank you for the gospel that uh, makes it possible to have access to you, to have freedom and liberty and invitation to um, dwell with you. I pray for each of us that we would make uh, a diligent effort to do so in this coming year. May our hearts be into it. And I ask this 